for split decision, had a tremendous amateur career, started boxing at six, had 385 fights, Olympic bronze medal in 08, gold at the World Championships in 05, came to the U.S. through Mexico, calling the travels from Cuba the closest I've ever felt to death. And he's going up against the 23-year-old, undefeated, Amir Amam. He's from Albany, New York, grew up there, and then moved down to Florida the past couple years to train and to fight. Hasn't been tested at the next level yet, but is 13-0 with 12 knockouts. Time to see what the fighters need to do to look like a champ. Brought to you by Just For Men. Teddy. Well, let's start with Ugas. Apply pressure and get him into the late rounds and then increase the attack. And for Imam, well, use your jab and overall speed to take what he gives you when he is covered up as he walks to you in that big of defense and then go to the body. That wouldn't hurt. Amir Amam, very active at this stage of his career. Six fights in 2013. This is his second fight in, in 2014. This is Amir Amam. Eight rounds between Imam. And Ugas right, with up, Thomas up, Taylor up, as the out. referee here in Los Angeles on a heavyweight Clean championship night. Guys, you got your instructions in the dressing room, all right? Protect yourselves at all times. Listen to my commands. Touch them up. Stay back. Stay right here, guys. Stay right here. Now they're done. Touch them up. Back to your corners. You know, right away, I got to say that Imam's people must have a lot of confidence stepping up like this after what they've been facing. I mean, this is a huge step up. Either that or they think very little of Ugas. And maybe that Ugas, with his 385 amateur fights, is a little bit of an empty can. In other words, he had too many amateur fights. I think if that's what they're thinking, they may have made a mistake. Should be interesting. A big test for Mr. Imam. No doubt about it. Imam, 13-0, 12 knockouts, but now going up against the 27-year-old Cuban with all that built-up amateur foundation and 15 wins in the pros. Just a huge step up in class and distance. Don't forget that for Imam. He's never been passed four rounds. Ugas has been 10 rounds three times. Both losses for Ugas were close. Split decisions with a little luck, maybe a few more punches. He could easily be undefeated here tonight. Yeah, we're having to break them early. Ugas was on the floor, Joe. Ugas was on the floor in his last fight. On February 28th, split decision 10 rounder, a loss to Emmanuel Robles. Um, tried to come with the one two and place that right hand. Now it's Ugas who comes in and through the right uppercut. There's a right hand from the undefeated upstate New Yorker. Cuban comes forward behind that jab. Smothering against the ropes as that left hand is tucked behind for a moment. <laughs> Young prospect working at range and had a glancing right hand that scored. Tried to come with the right hand again, nearly countered by the Cuban. Both guys want to get close. So in other words, they're looking, they're a little bit like that custodian that you see in the 
buildings with the big keychain. You know, they got all those keys and they're trying to figure out which key to the door to get in close. And right there, Ugas figured out the key, found the right key. For me, the key here is that jab. That's the skeleton key. That's the one that's gonna stabilize both guys on the outside and set up the damage that both guys are looking to do inside. Remember, you can go to the Friday Night Fight Facebook page and score along, click on live scoring all night long, jump in at any point. No, he got caught by a right hand there. Guys, get that water. Talked about the limited exposure of Amir Imam, the undefeated 13-0 fighter, and this being a step-up fight against Jordani Uga. I tell Cuban you, who landed was, a good right hand at the end of the first round. Yeah, if I was involved in the career, I'm going to say it very early, and I can look wrong, but I'm not afraid to take a chance, go out on that proverbial limb. Let him go. Let him go. Let every him once go. in a while. I think Imam's people made a so, mistake. I, if I'm in Bob in his career, I don't think I'm taking this fight. Not right now. Not after I just finished fighting 13 guys with a combined record of 87 wins, 143 losses, and 13 draws. No, no, no. To me, that's not preparation for this kind of step up. But we'll find out. Snapping that jab off the hip is the 23-year-old Amir Imam. <laughs> You know, in the fight interview, the feet, the getting all the bios together, Uga's uh, trainer, Stacy McKinley, the trainer for Iman, before the fight in that, when you're getting the information together, you know, the bios, he said that Ugas may be able to last a few rounds because of his defense, but I doubt that he's going to be able to last. Well, that's either confidence or just one. That's just overlooking an opponent completely. And if he passes that thought or he passes that thought on to his fighter, and it does become a tough fight, right now it's a tough fight, I think Iman may not be mentally prepped for it. Now, the rap on so many of the former Cuban nationals is that of a defensive style and an unattractive right, guys, style for the three. fans. Not the case with what we've seen with your Denny early on here. Yeah, you know why? Because he's lost two split decisions. That's right. He understands what he can't do. Sometimes you might not understand what you must do. Very important in life then to understand what you can't do. You can't get out of work tonight. He's been offensive-minded early on here, landed a good, solid right hand in the closing seconds of round number one, and has been taking some action to Amir Imam, the 13-0, 23-year-old here in round two. Imam settled in early on in this second round, but Ugas has shown spurts of offense. On a night when we will set the table for the WBC Heavyweight Championship bout set to come your way in this 17 by 17 foot small little ring between Berman Stavern and Chris Ariola as Teddy has the fight plan set for Ariola. All right, how does Ariola get his people chanting his name? New heavyweight champion. Well, he's got to notice that Stavern keeps that left hand low and he likes to flick the jab from his hip. When he does, though, every once in a while, he'll step back, step back straight. Ariola's got to be ready to go on him and with him with a double jab. He goes back, bang, 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 right, right to that rope. But don't stop there. You want to finish the job. You want the crown. Well, you know he's not going to stay there and take punishment on the ropes. He's going to move. Give him a little room to go that way. Anticipate, bang, and go with him. Can you do that? Well, now, take your bow. You're the new heavyweight champ of the world. There is Chris Ariel. Teddy, you know, after he had his nose broken in the third round of the first fight, went down. There were still moments deep into that first fight when he was pressing the action. He was showing glimpses of offense. Look, for me, coming off of that, for me, Ariola not only has to do things and finish when he's got him on the ropes, but he's got to do things to keep the attack going when he's in the middle of the ring. I noticed that after about five rounds in the first fight, 
that Stavern started to tire, started to look to rest a little bit on the inside, started to look to clinch a little bit. Ariola wasn't in shape, he allowed him to clinch. What he needs to do this time is recognize, not just on the ropes, but recognize in the center of the ring, when Stavern looks to rest, looks to tie up, don't let him. Take a little step back, create a little gap, keep the attack going. That is coming up. Right at the end of this co-feature will be the WBC Heavyweight Championship on the line here Saturday night primetime on ESPN. Folks, you don't have to fork over $75 for boxing here on a Saturday night. Sit back and just enjoy it with us. <laughs> Round three here. Good co-feature. Can Amir Imam stay unbeaten? <laughs> Heavy application of grease along the right side of the face of your Denny Ugas. As you see it, see it smeared right into his beard there. We'll see if the referee notices it well and asks for it to be wiped down. You're wondering why Ugas is being so aggressive. Well, I think I answered it already. He doesn't want to lose. He's lost two fights already. For him, this is a crossroads fight. You know, for Iman, it's a big step up. For Ugas, crossroads, emergency lights are blinking for him to win this fight. And one of the reasons why he's also getting close is the bigger man. First seven fights were actually more wed welterweight. Then he dropped to junior welter. While Iman has been a junior welterweight his entire career. So Ugas probably feels like he's the biggest, stronger guy. Why not take it to the inside? We're going to fire we're trying going to work at least on the inside here as they find separation. You see, decent hand speed from the undefeated, untested Imam, but we're not seeing decent leg movement. He's allowed himself to be trapped on those ropes too often. Often enough, Stop. maybe, for Ugas to steal the round. Just in those Stop. spots. Come on, guys. Get off. Get off his head. Get off it's his been head. less work in the final minute of this third round compared Box. to what we saw in the first two rounds. Now back at the center of the ring. See double jabs. Trying to control range here. The right hand was parried. We'll Comes to the end of round number three. Good start to our championship night here on ESPN. Your Denny Ugas in the red trunks has returned to his previous trainer. He worked five fights with Butch Sanchez, all wins. Then he was with John David Jackson, very accomplished trainer. He lost that fight most recently. And Sanchez says, listen, it's mental with the former Olympic medalist. Says he's the kind of kid that has to be motivated. He's an average fighter if he's not. He needs a lot of motivation. And he's showing a bit of motivation early on tonight. Landed a solid right hand at the end of round number one as he is giving a test to the 13 and old 23 year old Amir Imam. He's not only giving a test, I think he's giving a scare, as you're going to see right there on my scorecard. Teddy's scorecard has it three rounds to zip for the 27-year-old Cuban. And you, the viewer at home, we invite you to go to Facebook and score along. You can click on the Friday Night Fights page, live scoring. Join in at any point. Compare your judges' scorecards to Teddy's. And then the big reveal, of course, at the end of the fight. And we will have that up and working throughout the night for the WBC Heavyweight Championship fight as well. Your mom's doing a better job. Put a mark near your scorecards at home on this round. If this round turns, or this fight turns towards Imam, and he winds up winning, the turning point is right here. Doing a better job of just getting off first, taking advantage of those defensive lows by Ugas. But sometimes he does put those earmuffs on, goes into that pick doesn't get off, and gives Imam a chance to get off first on the front end. Ugas stop doing something, Joe. Stop being first with that jab. Picking it up a little bit now. But the first half of the round given away again, I think, to Imam. Simply because too much covering up by Ugas, not enough punching out. 
There's an example of where he didn't work when he had him against the ropes. Now he does come in. And that jab works well for Imam, creating some space. Imam has a pretty long, pretty good reach and a long right hand, longer than you would think. And Ulgaz needs to understand that, or somebody needs to explain it to him in the corner. Because Ulgaz, every once in a while, he'll pull out. Let him go, let him go. Even let after a jab, he'll Stop. pull back, no thinking Stay he's back. out of range, but finding uh. that he's not out of range with that long right hand of Imam. Imam's 5'11". Right, right there. As he backs up Ugas. We get you set for the heavyweight the title going. fight. Coming up a little later, the fight plan from Teddy on Berman's to Burn. Time! Come on, come on. How does Stavern leave you with the heavyweight title? Quicker hands. Take a look. I'm Stavern. Keeps that left hand low, likes to flick that jab out. And notice Ariola likes to move that right hand over and block the jab. But when you do that, you leave a little opening. And if you have quick hands, like Stavern does, well, you can do this. Bang, bang. Switch to a left hook. If Stavern does that, well, his hands will be quicker. And his hands will be raised as the new heavyweight champ of the world. They've been raised 12 straight times in the midst of an unbeaten streak, Herman's to burn. Expand upon that fight plan. What else should we be looking for with the well, Joe, it's important that it is for the burn, as you just saw there, to use his hand speed and to use his jab specifically, you know, Joe, to set up other in. offensive opportunities Muffy. like that hook. He also has to remember Muffy. something that worked for him Muffy. the first time. Back Go up. to the body of this big, Fuck. tough guy that's got a heck of a chin. Slow him down, downstairs. Don't get in love only with the hand speed upstairs. Bang that drum. Round five of our co-feature. That was a solid fourth round by Amir Imam. As your Denny Ugas appeared to slow a little bit. Not as active on the front end, more behind that jab. Amir Imam in the black trunks, 13-0 with 12 knockouts, taking a step up here against the former Olympic bronze medalist. As he touches him to the body there with that left hand. Now a little more aggression here. As you see the total punches according to CompuBox. Joe, you can touch a man to the body, especially when that man, that man being Ugas, well, puts those earmuffs on because when he puts the earmuffs on, just watch. His hands go up to block upstairs, but his elbows come up too. Look, there's a little gap downstairs. You can touch him downstairs, touch him upstairs, keep those hands up, and then touch him downstairs and find a clean opening to the body of Ugas. First round of the night was given for me at least. The last round to the undefeated Imam. I think that's pretty easy scoring to see. Three rounds to one, free, Teddy says, as Amir oh, yeah. Imam go, tries go. to work himself out Stop. of the hole. No doubt about round number one, as Ugas caught a flush right hand. Round two, he was much the aggressor. Three things leveled off a little bit, and then round four, Amir Imam settled in and took a bit of control. See, that's the key, settled in. Because Imam is now in uncharted territory. Territory that he's never settled into before. So he needs to be settled. Needs to be the boss. Needs to be in the driver's seat and confident as he's passed that four-round place for the first time. What I like about fighters is when they're going a distance they've never gone before, I don't want them to even be thinking about it. I just want them to be so concentrated on the things they're doing and in control of the things they're doing, the rounds are flying by. They come back to the corner and they say, what round is it? Six, six, what happened? Where'd the others go? <laughs> That's the attitude that I like to see with a fighter. You know, it's kind of like when you had a substitute teacher, you know, you have a teacher in the classroom when you were a kid. You were in the classroom a little more than I, I was. I enjoyed those but, days. Yeah, well, I didn't enjoy them quite as much, but I remember them. And then you're in the classroom, and you're getting bored. You're looking at the clock all the time, and it seems like it's a two-hour class. Then you get a substitute teacher, and all of a sudden, it seems like it's a 10-minute class. Back here at the Galen Center on a fight night 
in L.A., the WBC World Heavyweight Championship brought to you by Corona Extras. We are in round six of what has been an intriguing co-feature to see if Amir Imam, the 23-year-old, can stay unbeaten as an emerging 140-pound prospect. He's 13-0 with 12 knockouts, stepping up here against the Olympic medalist, Jordani Ugas. Joe Tessitore and Teddy Atlas with you ringside here in L.A. Saturday night primetime on ESPN in the heavyweight title bout will be coming up in just moments. So what I was talking about the last round, the, what I was talking about being in the classroom and, you know, sometimes you got a teacher and you just get a little bored. And you start looking at that clock and the clock doesn't move. And you keep looking at it and it's not moving. And a 45-minute class becomes, in your mind, a two-hour class. Then you get a substitute teacher to do something different, a little interesting. And what do you do? You don't look at the clock. You're just paying attention to what's going on. And it flies by. Same approach for me in the corner with fighters. Pay attention to what's going on. Don't think about the clock. Don't think about the rounds. And the time flies by. Right now, that's what Imam's doing. Paying attention to what's going on. And that's why you're not seeing any ill effect that he's in the sixth round and he's never been past four. He doesn't know. He's just having fun. And yet still needs to be careful because of what happened early on in this fight where perhaps if the judges surrounding us see it the way you saw it, he could be digging himself out of an early three-round hole. Exactly the way I have it. I have it now, three rounds to two, advantage you guys but coming on strong as you said imam now imam i mentioned earlier a couple rounds ago that quick hands but wasn't using those quick feet now he's using the feet a lot better to set up those hands getting off and then getting out like you see right there on cue keeping ugas a little off balance so that's the problem with him, guys. He needs to be set to work. Gets a little square. Look at his legs. Gets a little square. Again, puts those earmuffs on. Doesn't always work behind the jab. He needs time to get set. And the legs of Imam right now, the last couple of rounds, not giving him that time. Hands and legs working together for Imam. And as we come to the end of round six, he could be in position to have just squared things up on the scorecards because of it. Scheduled for eight in this co-feature as Imam tries to move his mark to 14-0. Heavyweight title fight will be coming up in moments. As Todd Grisham and ESPN.com's Dan Rayfield give us some insight on the future of that division. Gentlemen. Thank you, Joe. Indeed, I'm here with Dan Rayfield. Dan, look into your crystal ball if you could. What does the future hold for the winner of Areola and Stavrin? Well, it's very simple. The winner of this fight has already been mandated by the WBC to fight the undefeated American Olympic medalist, Deontay Wilder, as well because this is a vacant title to fight a second mandatory against a winner of a Mike Perez versus Brian Jennings fight. That fight, Todd, was canceled on Friday night because of an injury that Mike Perez suffered. So that is up in the air. But he's supposed to fight the winner of the uh, fight, Deontay Wilder, but I know they're going to want to fight Vladimir Klitschko, the real heavyweight champ. And Vladimir Klitschko has said he wants the winner of this fight. He told me that again this morning, and he wants to try to make that happen. And actually what he wants to do, not only fight the winner, but come back to America where he has not fought since 2008 when he unified titles against Sultan Abragamov. He wants that fourth belt, Todd. He wants the belt that his brother used to have that these guys are fighting for tonight. If that fight does happen, who stacks up better, in your opinion, against Klitschko, Stavern or Ariel? I don't think either one of them stack up very good against him. I mean, listen, Vladimir is going to be the favorite against both guys. Both of these guys tonight are powerful punchers, but Vladimir Klitschko is the bigger man. He's going to be the favorite. There you have it, Joe. The future, according to Dan Rayfield. It would be so nice to finally have some life to the heavyweight division as the Klitschkos have dominated it, but now an opportunity. The WBC belt tonight as Vitaly Klitschko vacated it, creating this opportunity for Stavern, number two according to ESPN.com, and Areola, number five according to ESPN.com, to fight for the WBC belt in just moments. Round seven here between the unbeaten Imam and Ugas. And you're seeing in round seven, right at the beginning, the formula that now has Imam, at least on my scorecard, even having won the last three rounds. Hands and legs. Gets off quick, Imam, 
gets full extension on those punches, and then use the legs to get out of range before Ugas can come back and answer. So according to Teddy, these last six minutes here will determine this fight as Imam has rallied back against Ugas. Three rounds to three, both Teddy and you, the fans at home, three rounds apiece. Right now, the fresher guy, the more confident guy, the sprightier guy, Imam. I mean, there's just more energy there. And with that energy, a sparkle in his eye, a confidence that he's got this. Maybe you guys, maybe the gas tank a little low. I saw him yesterday morning in the gym, looking at it on the scale, looking in a very, well, in a very concerned way, him and his people looking at the scale before the weigh-in, way before the weigh-in, hours before the weigh-in. I'm wondering whether or not they had trouble making this weight and some of that trouble showing itself right now with the Petro being a little low. Came in right at 140 pounds, but as you noted, he has fought higher. He debuted at 146. He's fought at 149. And he's leaving that left hand. He just got hurt a little bit. Oh, guys, leaving that left hand out there, not covering fast, and the right hand of Imam got in there. And now you can see the confidence building in the 13-0 Amir Imam. Yeah, oh, guys, he's wobbly. And he just lost his mouthpiece. The referee's going to look for a break in the action to replace it. Time. So he gets a break for a moment here with 21 seconds Go. remaining on, in round number seven mouthpiece. as Imam has yep. gained too control. Slow. Too slow. Let's go. Let's go. Mouthpiece in. Time in. Fuck. Ugas just confirmed what I thought. He's low on gas. If you weren't sure if he was low on gas, you just got to confirm. Try to buy time there. Try to get the mouthpiece back as slowly as possible to get some very needed rest. Good right hand that split the guard moments ago from Amir Imam. We will have one round to go. Stay with us. Last round, guys. Keep it clean. Glad you're with us. Fox. Joe Tessitore and Teddy Atlas ringside. Eighth and final round as Emir Imam in the black trunks is trying to stay unbeaten. You see the punches in the last round. He dominated with 19 connects to your Denny Ugas, only five. He is 13-0 with 12 knockouts. The prospect taking a step up tonight. Ugas came out strong early on, but Imam took control in round number four and hasn't given way. Just for the record, I said early in the fight that I would not have taken this fight for Imam after having compiled a record or four opponents to get to 13 and all who had a compiled record of 87 wins, 143 losses. I would have tried to get somebody in between Ugas and the next level before I went to Ugas' level. But his people were right, I was wrong. Imam has handled this moment and has grown right in front of us. A tough start, but a good finish. And it hasn't hurt Imam that Ugas has not used that jab enough. Uses it there, gets in, but then gets back out. Doesn't do what a man needs to do when he's behind. And that means attack when you get close. But up too often tonight, Ugas puts those earmuffs on as he does right there. Covers up and allows Imam to take advantage of that cover. To get off while he's covered. To keep him handcuffed while he's covered. But if the jab's coming, then it's harder for Imam to do that. Harder to pot shot when there's a jab in your face. Coming up on the final minute here of this co-feature as Imam tries to come in for a safe landing and move his mark to 14-0. And then we will get right to it. The WBC Heavyweight Championship. Who will be crowned a titleist? Will it be the first Mexican-American American and Chris Ariola, or the Haitian-born? Herman Stavern. That is coming right up after this fight. Again, I don't see any strength. Ugas is where he needs to be now. In a fight, in the last round, in a desperate moment, where he has to catch up, he gets inside, he doesn't do anything. I just don't see the gas in the tank. I'm guessing he took off too much weight. 
no excuses. Give all the credit to your mom. Watch ahead. Watch but I'm not ahead. seeing what you would expect to see from all guys in this kind of situation. No, he clearly slowed after that start. And there's a flush right hand from Imam. And now he tries to work to the belt line here in the closing no, seconds. A good look at a good young prospect in Amir Imam. Originally from Albany, New York, now fighting out of Florida and looking to go 14 0. We'll hear from the judges when we return. Great fight night in LA for the WBC World Heavyweight Championship brought to you by Corona Extra. Joe Tessitore and Teddy Atlas with you ringside here at the Galen Center where we felt it was pretty easy to score along with Amir Imam taking over the second half of the fight. Fans see it the same way on Facebook. You can join in all night long on the Friday Night Fight Facebook page. Fans see it five rounds to three for the unbeaten fighter. How do the judges have it here in Los Angeles? For that answer, we go to the ring to Barry Egan. Los Angeles, how about a huge round of applause for these two valiant warriors? To the scorecards we go. Judge Pat Russell scores about 79 to 73. Alejandro Roshin and Tony Krebs score the bout 78 74 for the winner by unanimous decision and still undefeated Amir Young Master Ima. It'll be fun to see his development. The 23 year old now 14 and 0 as he continues to stay active at this point. 36 victories, including 31 knockouts with three defeats. From Riverside, California, representing his Mexican heritage, Thomas Caballeros La Pesadilla, Cristobal, the Nightmare And across the ring, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing black with gold. Officially weighing in at 239, one half pounds. In his professional career, 25 fights, 23 victories, including 20 wins by knockout, with one defeat and one draw. Originally from IET, but now fighting out of Miami, Florida, by way of Las Vegas, Nevada, he's the WBC Silver Belt Champion, Bermain. Beware! Jack Reese is the referee. He was outstanding with his work the first time these two met up. WBC heavyweight title on the line. Ariola Stavern from here in Los Angeles. Everybody out except the Chief second. Right about now, it gets kind of lonely in there for the fighters. Now, peace. Now, you've been in this Not position peace. training this is a good. fighter to the heavyweight this championship. This is a little bit high in here, Don. I'm going to let him work. It ain't going to matter. Okay, I gave you both instructions in the dress room. I want to remind you, listen and obey my commands at all times. Protect yourself at all times. Fight hard. Fight clean. Good luck to both of you. Stavern has heard his first name pronounced every which way. Bermain, Bermani, it's Berman. And tonight, he wants to stamp it for everybody to know. Will he do it? He beat Ariola a year ago. Broke his nose. Or will Chris Ariola coming in lighter, tighter, prime, ready, finally climb to the top of the mountain? Teddy, noticeable with everybody in the ring with the pre fight hype. This is a small little tight space. 17 by 17. What impact could that have? The great late Joe Lewis once said they can run, but they can't hide. Neither one of these fighters are prone to running. They don't know how. But if they did, there'd be nowhere to go. They have to fight. Ariola comes in first and puts a right hand behind the jab. Everybody knows that Ariola needs to move his head more. 
because sometimes he allows the opponent to move his head forward. And that's not good. But for me, it's more than that. Not just moving your head. You got to move your head in the right position, not from too far away. You do it from too far away, which he did in the first fight, then Stubern lays back and times him. Times him when he comes in the middle. You must move that head at the right spot when you're close enough to draw the punch, like right about now. Ariel finding a little bit of early success, splitting the guard, doubling up the jab, and then Stavern fires off and lands a right hand to the left flank of the Mexican-American. What do we know about Stavern? What does Ariola know about him? He's strong. He can punch. That should tell Ariola he should not stand in front of him. If you're not doing something and keeping him busy in front, move to the side. I know you're not Muhammad Ali, but you do have legs. Move to the side a little bit. Don't lay right in front. Not only to avoid head punches, but to avoid those body shots that took a lot out of you the first fight. There's that left hand coming off the hip now of Stavern. We saw plenty of that in their first go round. The inside they go, and Ariola tried to get the best of it, turning over that left hand, looking for that right uppercut as well. Short right hand on the inside, as Stavern then throws a three-punch combination. Now, right now, Ariola's in good offensive position, but is he in good defensive position? His head is in the middle while he's throwing, leaving himself open to an uppercut. And he just caught a right uppercut and then a left hook, as Stavern finds a moment of success and backs him up to the middle of the ring. For me, when you get inside, yes, you want offense. But yes, you have to take care of your defensive responsibility. Get your head on the side where it's not easy to find. You're laying in the middle. Even though you got your hands up, your guard can be split by that uppercut. It was a wider right hand trying to get around that left guard of Areola. No feeling out here. Pick it up. They know right where they left off. They know each other well. Good competitive opening round here in Los Angeles for the WBC heavyweight title as they open up and he catches them. What did I just finish saying? It's great for Ariola to get in good offensive position, but what about defense? He lays right in the middle, and when you lay right in the middle, guess what? The other man can come back and catch you in the middle. That's exactly what happened, what I was alluding to early in the round. Ariola setting up for offense, forgetting defense. You can't leave your head in the middle, especially with a guy that knows how to counter and a guy who can back. Herman Stavern landing the two-punch combination in the final seconds of round number one. Good competitive opening stanza here for the heavyweight belt. See, Ariola thinks that every time he's got his throw, I saw that in the gym with him, he's got his throw from the middle. No, no, no. Someone needs to teach him, and it's late now, obviously, but he has to understand you can throw from the side. You don't want to throw from the middle all the time. You throw from the middle, again, you leave yourself open to counter, and that's the fight that the bird is fighting right now, looking to counter right now off the rope. Good exchange here in the opening minute of round two as Ariola found success with the left hand, splitting that guard and trying to bring a right hand behind it. He's not moving his head, but you know what he's doing now? Give him credit, Ariola. He's using his legs for defense, getting off and then getting out. Main thing, not standing there waiting for the receipt. Now a little more patient on the outside. He's halfway through that first round. Stavern picked up the pace. It was late in the first round. He scored well, much the case in their first meeting when he scored a crushing knockdown in the final seconds of round three. Hey, it's great when you hurt a guy. You love it. But it can be a curse, especially early in the fight. Stavern hurt Ariola in the first round. Sometimes then you just wait for that one shot again. And while you wait for it, you get out of hustle. So the corner of Stavern and himself have to be careful that hurting Ariola early was not a curse. Much more measured approach here. There's a lead right hand by Ariola as he backs Stavern up, catches him on the left, sends in the uppercut. See, right now, having hurt Ariola in the first round is 
is a curse for Stavert because he's looking for one shot instead of being a little more active like he was to set up that shot that hurt him. And now look at Stavert talking at Ariola as he snaps off that jab and tries to send a right uppercut in as well. Seemingly unaffected by the offensive surge in the middle of round number two here. See, again, Stavert now assuming taking for granted you don't do that in life and you don't do that in the square circle that he's going to land another shot and while he's waiting for that out other shot right now in the second round Ariola having a good comeback round and we got him. we've got life in the heavyweight division again we're going to take a short break and be right back to la end of two corona extra brings us tonight extra look watch the right hand from Ariola in that second round more importantly, watch the left hand of Stavern. It's not up. That's what you got to watch. Left hand's not up. Right hand gets in. We talked about it in the ORAT. Talked about it in the fight plan. Exactly what we thought would be there for Ariola. Joe Tessitore and Teddy Atlas with your ringside partner. We've been calling fights together for 13 years. For many of those years, this division dominated by the Klitschko brothers. Finally an opening, Vitaly Klitschko vacates, and we get this kind of an action fight that American fight fans have been craving in this division. Both guys know what's at stake. It's fun. Fun cause. Round and, three. And I'm going to say it again. It can be a blessing to hurt a guy. And it can be a curse. So far, and we're very early, hurting Ariola, which the burn did at the end of the first round has been a curse because he's been waiting for one shot again and he's been outworked a little bit by Ariola. Good snapping jab from Stavern as Ariola tries to return a bit of fire. Look, I know Stavern has the speed of your hands, but people are going to call me crazy, but Ariola can out him. You know why? Because there's stages just to burn step. He has to bring it up into that chamber. He starts in his hip. Take a look. He starts in his hip, and then he comes up to that midway chamber before he gets it off. That is an opportunity. That's a half a second. A half a second is a lifetime in that ring. That's an opportunity for Ariola to step into that gap and beat him with his jab. And he just beat him with the jab that time. That's where the corner needs to have eyes and pick up on that and tell him, listen, don't let him intimidate you with that jab. It might be quick, but it takes too long to get there. Get there first. Angry exchanges here now, coming up on the minute mark in round what? three. Guess what? Jab is starting to land by Ariola, and now that means other things are gonna land by the... Ariola sweeping right hand. He's on the attacks to burn, tried to land in between there, but he was backed up. Ariola wants to eat. And how do you eat? Well, you set the table with the jab, and then you go with the right hand, and you devour. It was a right hand that had Stavern backing up across the ring here. And now he sits right in the pocket. You know, Ariola has not been slowed down the last two rounds. Why? One of the reasons no body work by Stavern. That body work the first time Look at Ariola took a lot out and right now, nothing taken out of Ariola. Final moments here of round three, and Chris Ariola is taking control here. So that first fight, Ariola, we know he wasn't in as good a shape as he is, but he also had a lot of steam taken out by body shots. No steam being taken out. No body shot by You're Stavern. Ariola is showing the effects of not being hit to the body. What are you doing, Great. Now start taking the shot to the body shot, man. Spend too much time on the rope. Yeah, I know. He's trying to attack you on the rope. Spend too much time here. Hey, get that bucket down. That's the one you can't have up here. I don't spend too much time on the rope. Get in the point back. He can't do nothing, okay? When you're throwing that jab, okay? Move, move your telly hands, though. Okay, listen to me. Do not forget about his body. Dig, dig, come back up on top, right? Don't don't just headhunt him. Don't headhunt on him, okay, when he's on the rope. Touch him everywhere. Just don't headhunt. 
you heard the corner of Stavern, led by the veteran Don House, saying, get off the ropes. You're spending too much time on the ropes. Ariola had success with the jab Burn and the it. right hand up top. But Henry Ramirez, his longtime trainer, says, don't forget about the body. Round number four for the WBC Heavyweight Championship here in Southern California. Ariola's home as he's trying to become the first Mexican-American heavyweight titleist. Ariel has been cut over both eyes in his career. He's clean so far. Both CompuBox, players. Teddy, shows the last round. Ariel a 41 to 18 connect advantage. He dominated that third round. Yeah, and it started with the jab. The jab that a lot of people thought he couldn't get over on the quickest to burn. But as I pointed out in the second round, the burn does have the quicker hands, but he goes into phases to get them off. With that jab, he has to bring it up to a level before he throws it. That time wasted allows Ariola to beat him with the jab. That is not where they want him, as he was up against the ropes again. Tried to throw a lead right hand, and now in the corner as Ariola looks to apply pressure, and there's a left hook! Crashing home as Severn stays sturdy and throws a punch back. Well, when you go downstairs and you put water in the basement like Ariola just did, it leaves an opportunity to put a light on in the attic. And that's exactly what Ariola did. Downstairs and then upstairs. And they settle back here halfway through round four. Burn is talking to Ariola, taking tiny steps forward, popping that jab off the hip. Look at him talk, just like they've done the past two days. Again, you got heavyweights here, everybody knows it's about the big punches. But for me, no, 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 it's about the jab. And again, the quicker hand is to burn. He is not serving himself with that low left hand. He has to bring it up before he throws it, and it's allowing Ariola to get into that pocket, allowing him to get into that sweet spot where he can get off his jab. The force to burn gets it in position to flick his out. The CompuBox showing you there that the work rate of Ariola has gone up dramatically compared to their first encounter as the burn lands a combination here. Final half minute of round four. Remember that big punch at the end of the first round. Ever since then, what has Stavern been doing? Not moving his hands enough. Waiting for that one shot. And what's Ariola doing? Marching forward. Taking hills. And if you take enough hills, well, then you can take a title. Both men trying to get work on the inside here. Good heavyweight title fight from L.A. Stay with us. WBC World Heavyweight Championship brought to you by Corona Extra. Glad you were with Joe Tessator and Teddy Atlas ringside in Los Angeles. A Saturday night of championship boxing that you don't have to pay $75 for and be disappointed as the heavyweight division is giving you good entertainment early on here with the green belt on the line. Vitaly Klitschko vacated, leaves an opening for Berman Stavern and Chris Ariola, one man to be called champ tonight. You know what's helping Ariola? We talked about different scenarios, you know, different components of this fight. But I'm gonna tell you right now, one component no one's talked about that's helping and serving Ariola so far, activity. Ariola took an in-between fight. It's been eight months since Ariola fought. He took a tune-up fight. Stavern took no tune-up fight. It's been one year and one month since Stavern last got in the ring. Ariola is a little sharper. And he bounced back with a win, a first-round knockout of Seth Mitchell. That was September of 2013. And then this came about. And he shaved off some weight. As did Stavern, as he tries to get back to that jab in the center of the ring. Avoid the back against the ropes. See that block of the right hand now just a moment ago Ariola blocked that jab of Stavern with his right hand he moved that right hand over to block that jab that leaves a little opening for that left hook 
Edge. The Fern has the quickness to turn that champ into that. He it's nearly all. did it right there, Teddy, as he turned over that left hand and he got out the side door. That's what I think he should be looking for. One of the things the Fern should look for. Run something off that jab. Don't be satisfied just with the jab. Use the jab up. Use that jab for something else. Now here's Areola where he has accomplished his best work so far tonight. Yeah, this is where Stavert's looking to counter. Looking to catch Areola taking a picture, admiring his work, not moving his head after his last punch. The problem is Areola made a little adjustment after the first round. He's using those legs a little bit. He gets his punches off, uses his legs to get out of range. Doesn't hang around as much. Great right hand is just a glancing blow that time. Stavrinus is with the looping right hand and then a hook that was off the mark. Boy, are they talking it up throughout this whole night. Listen, Ariel's ahead in this fight for a reason. He's been busier. He's a little more tired right now than Stavern. My eyes tell me for a reason, because he's been busier. Frequent fixture, so many big fights. There is Pete Rose sitting ringside to take in WBC heavyweight title bout. Mario Lopez, big fight fan, often seen working out at the local gyms here in L.A. As we are at the Galen Center at USC, round number six between Ariola and Stavern. You know, we've talked a lot about the broken nose suffered by Ariola when he got dropped the first time in the first fight in the third round. What we haven't talked about is he also got cut over his left eye. There's a little redness around the eyes of Ariola. No blood, but a little redness. So moderate swelling as he tries to place that right hand again. Again, activity is very important in anything you do. Ariola, last time he was in the ring, eight months ago. He took a tune-up. Stavern, one year, oh, one month. A sweeping right hand has Ariola on spaghetti legs and down. Six, seven, eight. You okay? A lot you need of to time. Yourself. Give me your gloves. A lot Give of times. Walk to me. Walk to me. No, 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 no. You're this is buying time. This corner. is buying time for Ariola. Valuable time. He just bought himself 10 seconds. Can he survive? The big power of the Haitian slugger. Stavern trying to hit a home run here in L.A. Headshot after headshot. Ariola doesn't look good at all. Second knockdown score. Four, five, I'm looking six, right in his eyes, seven, and I don't know that they're clear eight, enough. Jack eight. Reese has a decision to make here. Legs take, right, legs on right. Give your gloves. Too much time. You sure? You can defend yourself. He's going to let it go. Time. Can he survive a minute? Too much time. Headshot after headshot. And that is it. That's, it. That's, it. That's it, man. Too much, Chris. The first Haitian-born fighter to win a heavyweight championship. Berman Stubborn has toppled Areola. The great thing about power, you could be losing rounds. And you always have that great eraser that erases what happened in the previous round. You just saw that a great eraser at work by Stavern. You are going to see an outpouring of emotion from this 35-year-old who's prone and now will come to his feet. A young man who broke down yesterday prior to the weigh-in simply discussing those who have supported him on his attempt to get to the top. His mom, Rosemary, 
took Berman and his sisters to Miami from Haiti when he was just 10 years old. She took work as a seamstress. She put herself through nursing school. The youngest son of eight girls and five boys who had to earn every inch of it as a late bloomer to the game is now a heavyweight champion. And these two men who were in each other's faces for the past two days at the final presser and the weigh-in showing what it means to be true competitors and warriors of this game. Moments ago, that right hand that's embracing Areola was sending him to the canvas. Believe me. Believe me. I'll fuck with you anytime. Because you're real. Areola just couldn't survive. Final two minutes there. Let's go back, Teddy, to the first knockdown. So you always hear me talk about it's one thing to throw a punch out, it's another thing to bring it back. That jab is thrown out slow. It comes out and it doesn't come back fast. Watch again. The left hand does not come back fast. The right hand gets over it, hits him on the temple. Bad place to get hit. Everyone thinks the chin's the only bad place. Temple, a very bad place to get hit. Throws your legs off, throws your equilibrium off, and it's hard to come back. Again, the right hand over the slow left hand of Ariola. It's one thing to throw the punch out. It's another thing to develop the habit of bringing it back fast before you can get caught with that right hand counter. Here's the second knockdown, Teddy. Again, he's already hurt an accumulation of punches again. Not on the chin, around the head area. Keeping Ariola in a place he doesn't want to be. In a place where everything is distorted, everything is fuzzy. And the legs just not working right. Last look before Jack Reese had to say that he has seen enough. Ariola coming forward. Severn doing a good job of actually counterpunching there, taking what's given him. As Ariola's head fell forward, Severn clipped off some nice counter shots again on the forehead area, keeping Ariola in that fuzzy place. But again, the big punch, the punch that made him champion of the world, the right hand of the slow left hand of Ariola. You throw that jab out, you got to bring it back fast. You got to test hot water. Ariola brought it back slow. It's the bird. It's the new heavyweight champ of the world in the WBC world. Let's make it official. And for that, we send it up to Michael Buffer. Ladies and gentlemen, the end comes at two minutes and two seconds of round number six. The winner by knockout victory. He is now the fighting pride of IET. And now the WBC heavyweight champion of the world, Hermain Beware-Stevens! He has won 13 straight fights. He does it decisively, with power, with a spectacular ending, a knockout victory. The 21st of his career, the 24th win, and the biggest moment of his professional life. You see, Joe, when you're in there with a banger, with a TNT puncher, you can't make mistakes. Stavern could make mistakes. He made them early. He was losing early rounds in this fight. I had him behind on the scorecard, on my scorecard. But when you can punch, and as I said earlier, you have that great eraser. You make up for all those mistakes. Ariola could not afford to make the mistakes that Stavern could afford to make. Bernardo is with the new champ. That's right, and euphoria here in the ring with Berman Stavern. Talk to me about the emotion of hearing those words and new heavyweight champ. I didn't even hear, I didn't even hear them yet. It was so loud, I didn't hear it. But damn. <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs>